If you follow us on our Facebook page or on our YouTube channel, you know that we try to put out a little bit in advance um, what we what the Lord has shown us and what we'll cover when we meet. In this part of the year, it's obvious that we talk about the resurrection especially, but also just the specific words that the Lord is dropping in for us. And, and, and as we're praying and, and we're hearing from the Lord, we believe that's a, a corporate word for you. And, and we can tell the difference between what we're feeling personally and what our, our, the body of Christ is feeling. And this is not an easy time, right? Because I'm, I said it earlier, it's getting to the point where just about all of us know somebody who's been impacted, even if we haven't personally been impacted. We, we know people. Um, one of my very close friends has a daughter who's a, a nurse in the ICU, and it's like warlike conditions where she is in California. And um, so they go in and put in an eight to 10 hour shift and, and that's their job and they have to go back and do it every day and there's been more and more people coming in. So we're not ignoring the fact that it's a difficult time, but in a war, you have to keep your, your face like Flint, like Jesus and know what your mission is and not get distracted from your mission. We wanna be heroic people because that's the spirit that God placed in us, that warrior. We're worshiping warriors, right? We, we have the ability to have an open heaven over our lives and get downloads as he speaks to us, but then we act like the sons of Issachar. We don't just know the times and the seasons. We know what we're supposed to do. And we're moving forward. We're not moving back. That'll be next week's song. <laughs> Gotta have you back, Terry. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna talk about prayer. That's a really important subject to the Lord. Um, if you saw the cover on our Facebook page, you know that it says we're releasing the power of pa passionate prayer, okay? And that comes from James uh, chapter 5, and we know it from the traditional translation like the King James, is the effective, effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much, right? So I just want to pray, Lord, help us to be that passionate group of people. We know your word says that Elijah was a man just like we are. We're no different. And yet he prayed, and it didn't rain for three and a half years, and then he prayed again, and it rained. So if Elijah was just like we are, Lord, help us see ourselves in that mantle of power that we too have your spirit living inside of us, and you want us to operate in that. And we want to be people that our effective, fervent prayers avail much. And we release passionate prayer, an anointing for passionate prayer to accomplish much in this time of war and in this season that we're in. All right, so I'll get to that part in a little bit about Elijah and how James ties us into Elijah. But I just wanted to remind you about prayer. It's so important. And you didn't even come in the kingdom without saying a prayer. That was the entrance way in. You, we call it the sinner's prayer, right? Is from Romans 10, you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. That, that was the, the opening door to get you into the kingdom. But seeking the Lord, and I quoted it already from the Psalms 34, I sought the Lord. He heard me and he delivered me from all my fears. That's called prayer. When you see in the Bible, somebody says, I sought the Lord, that's that one-on-one -on -one time where you're waiting to hear from him and you're saying, Lord, I'm here, I'm in a posture where I'm listening because I need direction right now. And his sheep know his voice. And the voice of a stranger, they will not follow. So you really need to tune your ear in to what the Lord is saying to you. He loves you. He's a good father. So why wouldn't he want to give you direction on a minute-by-minute -minute basis? He's never sleeping or slumbering. Jeremiah, we all know 29.11. I know the thoughts and plans I have for you. But two verses later in Jeremiah 29.13, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. See the condition there? The conditional promise is, yes, I am to be found, but you have to seek me with all your heart. And I have a sense in my own you know, life and in my work that I do, which is still involved with uh, the markets and how wild the stock markets have been in the last month, that people are having a lot more time to reflect now that we've been isolated. And they're starting to realize that they've been building parts of their lives on sinking sand and not on the rock of Jesus. When you have a lot of time to meditate, you start to see what's really important because where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. And if you have all this time to examine yourself, you can realize, I better consider my ways. That's what the prophets always said to people in the Old Testament. Consider your ways. And in one case, um, 
God had provided a way for them to build God's house, but they had stopped building. And he said, consider your ways. I didn't bring you here out of Babylon to build your own houses. I brought you out of slavery to build my house. You build my house, and then your house will get built because you, you'll be a blessing. And, and the prophet had to come and warn them and say, this isn't the plan that God set for you. So that's for all of us. With all this free time that we have that we weren't expecting, examine us. Examine. Say that to the Lord. Lord, show me my heart. Show me where I've been building on sand and not on the rock. So that's part of it. It's Jeremiah 29, 13. You'll seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart, not part of your heart. And then Psalm 34, 6 says, this poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. I'm just trying to encourage you, as part of this free time that you have, spend more time in prayer. Just crack open the Bible, go through the Psalms, go through the Proverbs, pray out what you're reading, and just ask the Lord to commune. And, you know, the Internet's still working. There's a million amazing Christian songs on the Internet. There's all kinds of playlists. That, that you can create. There's really no excuse other than your own desire to do it. And, and don't allow that, that depression to try to hit you and, and unplug your energy source. Your energy source is heaven. And then there's this whole group of scriptures that are about making our requests known. So it's not a passive activity. Prayer is an activity, not passive. It's active. Jesus told us when we pray in Matthew 6.10, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's a request. Don't just think it. Say it. Speak it out. Boy, how much have we been hearing for the last year about the decade of the decree that we're in right now? Pay, the new decade, 80. We come out of the 70s. We're in the 80s on the Hebrew calendar, 57, 80. Decade of the decree. Let your kingdom come. Right in the Lord's prayer. And then James 4, 2 who's the Lord's brother, and he was a very pragmatic guy, and he said, hey, you have not because you ask not. You haven't made your request known. Don't just sit around waiting for God to do it. If you don't have it, it's because you haven't asked. Luke 11, 9, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door shall be opened. These are all active words. 1 Corinthians 14, 1, I love this one. It says, be zealous for the gifts of the Spirit. Same thing. Don't just sit there waiting. Well, if he wants me to have it, he'll give it to me. No, ask him for it. Like any good child would with their parents. When they want something, just keep going back. Be persistent. And then Philippians 4, 6. You probably know it already, but it says, Be anxious for nothing in every situation. By prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God with your mouth out loud. And then Romans 8.26, you all probably know the principle here, praying in the Spirit. In Romans 8.26, it says, The Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. All right, so even when you're not sure what to do, we sang it in the song today by Eddie James, Breakthrough. When I don't know what to do, I look to you. Second Chronicles chapter 20, Jehoshaphat was the king, and they were about to be attacked by this huge army. And he said, Lord, we don't know what to do against this army, but when we don't know what to do, our eyes are on you. Second Chronicles 20, verse 12. Ta hold on to those verses right now, because each day could present situations we've never seen before. I went to the uh, store yesterday. Everybody had a mask on. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. But we've never lived in this kind of situation like this before. And if you're not careful and you lose your moorings, if you're not tied to the rock, all of a sudden it's like, man, what's going to happen next? What's going to happen? And all these what-if games. No, don't do it. When you're not sure what to pray, Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. And, and he makes intercession for us with groanings that can't be uttered. And then in Ephesians 6, 8, which I know a lot of you have memorized a lot of those scriptures because it's about the armor of God and spiritual powers, principalities, rulers of darkness, right? It's all about spiritual warfare. And it says, pray in the spirit on all occasions, Ephesians 6, 18, with all kinds of prayers and requests, okay? You're making your requests known to God. And then there's so many prayers of faith, but look them up. Matthew 21, 22, if you believe, you will receive whatever you ask in prayer. Mark eleven twenty four. 24, again, I know a lot of you have this memorized. Whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you've received it, and it will be yours. 
You could say, yeah, but I've done that before and it didn't work. Don't stop. Build your faith. Keep doing what the Lord told us. We don't know how it all works. We just know that we can be obedient and do what he tells us to do. And then same thing from the chapter we'll look at in James 5.15. The prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up, right? You remember that part where it says, is any among you sick? Call the elders of the church, anoint them with oil, and the prayer of faith right here will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. Just keep doing it. Don't question God. Don't base it on past experience. If you've prayed for somebody and they didn't get well, doesn't mean it doesn't still work. You just be obedient and do what the Lord tells. Uh, if somebody's praying for me, I want them to believe 100% that the Lord can do this for me. I don't want it to be conditional. Well, maybe. Mm -mm. And one that really, this category is very big in the Bible, about casting your cares upon the Lord. That's very much a present word right now because the cares are building up over finances, over jobs, over the economy, the stock market, too much time on our hands, right? Wow, too much time on our hands. And if you're not intentional about being productive with that time, you could do a lot of non-redemptive things with your free time. But I say discipline yourself. Let it be redemptive. Study the word of God. Journal is huge. Just spend your time journaling on what's going through your spirit, man, and then look for scriptures to counter the specific pattern the enemy's coming after you with because th this word has every answer you need in it for whatever situation, even one that you've never been in before. So you all know this verse in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, but it's good to be reminded. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. So right now, just turn it over to him. Say, Lord, that's been me. I've been weary and burdened down. I'm not myself. I've been eating too much. I'm, I'm gaining weight. I'm not getting the exercise I need. I'm spending too much time watching stuff that's not redemptive and filling my brain with things that aren't going to help me. It's okay. Just let him know. I don't want to do this. I need your help. And he says, come to me if you're weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke, Jesus says, is easy, and my burden is light. And then specifically, Jeremiah, again, you'll seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Therefore, Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 7, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him. It's right in the word. All your cares. Cast all your cares upon him. And it has been humbling for a lot of people to realize how fragile the whole thing is. That we went from, you know, Christmas time, and then all of a sudden we're into the new year, and in a matter of minutes, six million people are filing for unemployment. It seems, on the timeline, it, it just, like, so fast. Everything changed so quickly. Humble yourself. Say, God, I, I, I was too much in charge of my own thinking. I didn't realize I'm depending on you, and I need you to get me through this thing. So cast all your care upon him, for he cares for you. And then Psalm 55, 22 says almost the same thing. Cast your burden upon the Lord, and he will sustain you. Write this one down, Psalm 55, 22. Cast your burden upon the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. That's a memory verse right there. Memorize that one. I can cast my burden on you, Lord. You will sustain me. You will never let me be shaken. All right, so this is what the title was on, um, on our Facebook page. It said, Tremendous Power is Released Through Passionate Prayer, Heartfelt Prayer of a Godly Believer, right? So release the power of passionate prayer. You have it within you. Don't wait for somebody else to do it. You have it within you. And that's verse 17, right, in that same chapter, James chapter 5, verse 17 James is the Lord's brother. Now, don't, forget, don't underestimate what that means. He was the leader of the church in the book of Acts because he was with Jesus so much. There was such an impartation. He was a wise man. We only have this one epistle that he wrote, but it gets to the point on a bunch of things. And this is one of them. And it's called the Berean Study Bible. This is the translation. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it wouldn't rain, and it did not rain for three and a half years. So just stop there for a minute and say, do I see myself that way? Or do I think Elijah was on a different level than me? Well, James is wanting to, wanting to make it real clear to us, you're no different than him. Amen. He's a man just like us. It's a little convicting, isn't it? 
because he displayed a whole lot of faith. Now, he had his moments of weakness, too, when Jezebel came after him, and he went and hid in the cave. So, you know, he was a human being just like the rest of us. He's a man just like us, but he saw something in the country that was taking them into the path of destruction. And he decided to confront the king, Ahab, and said, you know what? I've prayed to the Lord, and it's not going to rain for three and a half years, which obviously would cause a drought, right? So he knew that the situation that he was speaking over was necessary in order for the nation to change. I'm not saying God is causing coronavirus. You have to be really careful that you don't impute onto God what the devil has been doing. But can God use this coronavirus? Yes. If my people who are called by my, my name will humble themselves and pray, purpose to seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. So it's a wake-up call for all of us to stop wasting time on idle things that are not redemptive. All right, so he was a man just like us. He prayed, and it, it didn't rain for three and a half years, and then he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain. That's James 5, uh, verse 18. Now, one of the things that convicted me was about not thinking I was on the same level of Elijah was I remembered on the Mount of Transfiguration <laughs> when, you know, the, James and Peter and John were there with Jesus. All of a sudden, he transfigured, and who showed up? Elijah and Moses were there, right? So Elijah clearly has a high rank in the kingdom of God. And yet, James is saying that we're a man just like Elijah. So I'm getting convicted to say, stop putting yourself down on a lower scale than what God sees you as. And that's in Matthew 17, too, if you want to look it up. It says, the face of Jesus was shining like the sun, and its clothes became as white as light. And suddenly Moses and Elijah appeared and began talking with Jesus. Man, this is some council meeting, don't you think? Moses and Elijah are just there now talking to Jesus in this transfigured state. And James says, we're a man just like him. Selah. <laughs> Pause and meditate on that one. Proverbs 29, 2 says, When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when a wicked, wicked man rules, the people groan. All right, this is just a biblical principle of why the godly need to be in places of authority. And in Elijah's case, it was so bad that he had to confront the sin and the situation between Ahab and Jezebel. And again, I'm not trying to make commentary on today's world other than we can do what we can do as the church. And we can pray for our country, pray for the people that are in authority. Don't become a negative force in that process. Pray for righteous leadership in your county, in your state, and obviously in American government in Washington, D.C. Because when the righteous are in authority, we have a better chance to prosper. It's still difficult. But when, this says, when a wicked man rules, the people groan, and that's what happened. Elijah found himself in a country with a wicked king, Ahab, who married Jezebel, and a lot of you know about her. So I'll just take you there for a minute. In 1 Kings 16, verse 30, it says, Ahab did what was evil in the Lord's sight even more than any of the kings before him. And as though it were not enough to follow the sinful example of Jeroboam, he married Jezebel, the daughter of King Ethbal of the Sidonians, and he began to bow down and worship to Baal. All right, this is the king of Israel. is bowing down to a foreign idol, Baal. And he married the daughter of one of those uh, Sidonians that his name was Ethbal. Her father's name had Baal right in it. So this is a problem. And first, in verse 32 of 1 Kings 16, it says, First they have built a temple and an altar for Baal in Samaria, and then he set up an Asherah pole, and this is quite a condemning verse in 1 Kings 16, 33. It says of Ahab that he did more to provoke the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than any of the other kings of Israel before him. That's really saying something. And when God has people who know how to hear his voice, and that's called Christians, we're supposed to live in a prophetic lifestyle that we're hearing the voice of the Lord, sons of Issachar. We, we know the signs and the times, and we know what we should do. That's what prophetic people do. And that's what Elijah had to do. 
So he goes to him in, in chapter 17, verse 1, Elijah told King Ahab, as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, the God I serve, there will be no dew or rain during the next few days until I give the word. Then the Lord said to Elijah, all right, let me just back up for a minute. You put yourself in that position where you've had to confront something that's not comfortable to confront. He's the king of the whole country. And we know it created a lot of tension between Jezebel and Ahab against Elijah. They wanted to take him out. This is chapter 17. 18 is when you see that amazing scene of the, the contest of the two altars and God bringing down fire. <laughs> but this is the, the chapter right before. Now remember, James said Elijah was a man just like us. And now verse 2 of 1 Kings 17 says, after he gives the word to Ahab, not going to rain. Then the Lord said to Elijah, okay, what is the Lord saying to you? We have to all ask ourselves that question because he's always speaking to us because he loves us and he's a good father. We sang it, right? What is he saying to you right now? And you say, well, I'm not hearing him too clearly right now. Well, then remember, Jeremiah 29, 13 said, when you seek me, you will find me if you're seeking me with all your heart. So could be one of the reasons you're not hearing clearly is you haven't been seeking him with all your heart. Maybe go on a fast. That's, that's a good sign that says, Lord, I'm willing to do whatever it takes because I need to hear your voice. So this is what the Lord tells him. Go to the east and hide by the Kareth Brook near where it enters the Jordan River. Drink from the brook and eat what the ravens bring you. Now, how many of you would have been thrilled about that word? Bring what the raven? You said eat what the ravens bring me? Are they going to stop at Burger King and get me a Whopper first and bring it in a bag? Like, what's a raven going to bring me? This is what we do in the natural mind. And, and why God loved this man so much. Go to the east, hide by the Kareth Brook, go drink from the brook, for I have commanded the ravens to bring you food. And, and Elijah's like, really? Can't you die? What's plan B? Give me a different plan, God. That sounds ridiculous. Ravens. Who ever heard of ravens bringing people food? He didn't say any of that, did he? So what it says, verse 5, so Elijah did as the Lord told him. <laughs> He's a man just like us, but boy, did he have faith, didn't he? If he could go hide by the brook and wait for the ravens to bring him food, then I better make some changes in my life, because I don't know if I had the faith to do that. Well, it says he was just like us. He camped beside the Kareth Brook east of the Jordan, and the ravens brought him bread and meat each morning and evening. And he drank from the brook. So if you believe God, it's going to look silly to other people who don't. I mean, the Bible says that the things of the Spirit can't even be understood by people who are still in the carnal flesh. So if you've got unsafe friends and family and you're doing something and they say, that sounds ridiculous. I, say, I don't care how it sounds. I know the Lord told me to do this. So I'll see you in a month and let's check back and see who had good results. And when you know how to hear the voice of the Lord, boy, you get really good results. All right, so things change again. They brought him the bread and the meat, but after a while, it says in verse 7 of 1 Kings 17, after a while, the brook dried up, for there was no rainfall anywhere in the land. Well, he's not surprised by that, because he's the one that called the drought. So he knew while he was at the brook, this is only one stop, because this water is going to go away at some point, and then what am I going to do? He didn't have to wonder about what he was going to do because the Lord was telling him what to do. We have to say the same thing right now. I'm not sure about my future, but I know who holds my future. And he is going to give me direction to cause me to prosper. I have to have faith for that, no matter how confusing it looks. And if you're around a lot of pessimistic people right now, probably not a good idea. When Jesus needed to see somebody get healed, he didn't bring a bunch of unbelievers. He brought people in a room that had the faith to believe for the miracle. So watch what goes in your ear gate and your eye gate and let it be the word, the truth of the word, teaching from anointed people. You can get a lot of that on our YouTube channel, lots of hours of really good teaching on our YouTube channel. So, okay, runs out of water. And now verse eight says, then the Lord said to Elijah. Okay, so if you're in that place where, okay, Lord, you told me to come down here and the ravens would come. I had enough faith to believe that. But now there's no more water, so what are you going to do? And don't be looking at your watch. 
Well, anytime now, Lord, you can tell me anytime, whenever you're ready, just tell me what the next step is. He loves you. He's going to tell you. So he said, this is what the Lord said in verse 8. Go and live in the village of Zarephath near the city of Sidon. I've instructed a widow there to feed you. Did he question it? No. Verse 10. So he went to Zarephath. Man, it's convicting watching this guy, isn't it? He hears the Lord and he does it. He doesn't ask how. He doesn't ask why. What took you so long? He's just obedient. And it says, as he arrived at the gates of the village, he saw a widow gathering sticks, and he asked her, would you please bring me a little, uh, I'm sorry, a little water in a cup? Verse 11, she was going to get it, and he called to her and said, bring me a bite of bread, too. But she said, I swear by the Lord your God that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house. I only have a handful of flour left in the jar and a little cooking oil in the bottom of the jug. I was just gathering a few sticks to cook this last meal, and then my son and I will die. Verse 13. Now, remember, the Lord told Elijah that the Lord was going to speak to this woman and tell her to feed him. Remember that? She doesn't say anything about that when she sees Elijah. She doesn't say, oh, yeah, the Lord told me you were coming. She's wound up in her fear because she thinks she, her and her son is going to die. She knows he's a man of God because she says in verse 12, I swear by the Lord your God, I don't have a single piece of bread. So she knows who he is. And verse 13, boy, this is key right here. But Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Let's just focus on that for a minute, okay? This is the time we're living in where there's a lot of fear in the atmosphere. Don't let it be contagious on you. Well, I mean, does she have a reason in the natural to be afraid? Yes. But what does the man of God say? Don't be afraid. That's got to that's gotta warn you that you can get hijacked emotionally, right? She had reason in the natural to be concerned, but she was with a man of God, and he was hearing the Lord's voice, and that's a really good thing to have, isn't it? <laughs> Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. I just want to burn that in for you. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Go ahead and do just what you've said, meaning she was going to go get and, you know, make this little bit of bread left. Then use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. For this, I'm sorry, I skipped an important part. He said, don't be afraid. Go ahead and do what you just said, but make a little bread for me first. <laughs> then use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Come on, say that with me. I can't hear you, but I just want you to say it anyway. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. All right, so man, if we're not living our lives this way, then we're really living underneath the level that he wants us to be at. Maybe you're not hearing a, a loud, audible voice, but you should be able to go to Scripture and say, these are the times and seasons I'm in. What, what's your word for me, Lord? And man, if he loves us like we know he does, he's going to give you a word. Now look, this is, what, this is what the Lord said to Elijah. There will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers. Speaking that to this widow. Until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. Now you'd have to have a lot of faith to believe him for that, wouldn't you? If you've only got enough for one little bit left, she's with a prophet. The Lord told her he was coming. So she war he warned her in advance that Elijah was going to be coming. She had to have enough faith right now to ignore the natural and say, okay, the man of God said that I'm always going to have enough. I don't know how I'm going to have enough, but I'm getting the how out of here because I don't know how. I'm just going to believe the prophet. He said there will always be flour and olive oil left in my containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. In verse 15, just like Elijah was obedient when God spoke to him, Verse 15 says, so she did as Elijah said. Huh. And she and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days. Oh, that's an encouraging word, isn't it? There, were always, there was always enough flour and oil left in the containers, just as the Lord had promised through Elijah. And I know what time it is. It's 11.05. So there's so much in that story. Read the rest of 17. Read 18. It's so encouraging. But I'm going to jump to the New Testament and finish up here. Again, not that you have so much to do at home, but I do just want to honor everybody's time. And this is from Luke 8:41, And a lot of you are familiar with this, but I just want to tie in what we just read from 
Elijah's life, and James chapter 5 saying Elijah was a man just like us. That's the thing that I really want to bring home to you, is that you have more power and more gifting than you realize and that you give yourself credit for. The voice of all your critics is louder than the voice of God in your head. Break that off. I just say, no, God, I'm, a, I'm who you said I am, not who the world says I am, not who my critics say I am. So it says in, in chapter 8 of Luke, uh, verse 41, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house. Okay, so you probably know the story. Jairus is a ruler of the synagogue. So the people in the synagogue were not too thrilled about Jesus, that was his biggest critics, the Pharisees. And this man was a ruler, and he was crossing lines and coming to Jesus and asking for help. And you probably know why, because he had a daughter at home, and it was his only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. So this man put down all the conventional wisdom and said, I don't care that Jesus is in a different camp. I need a miracle. I'm going to cross lines here and go to Jesus and ask him to come and heal my daughter. And the Lord loves that, doesn't he? He loves when he sees us act out of faith. He says it many times, your faith has made you whole. So this man had a lot of faith. He was rejecting what his critics were going to say and said, I don't care. I love my daughter. She's 12 years old. She's my only daughter. And if this man could do something, I want him to come to the house and pray for her. So difficult situation. Verse 49, while he was still speaking, and I jumped ahead a little from 42 to 49, and you probably know the story that in between, the woman with the issue of blood came up to Jesus, and she was healed. And I'm not going to go into that for time's sake. But Jairus is waiting for Jesus to come. It's urgent. Come to my house. My daughter's dying. He gets sidetracked with this woman with the issue of blood. And now all of a sudden, somebody from the ruler's house comes to him and says, you might as well stop because your daughter's dead. Don't bother the master anymore. Verse 49, while he was still speaking, someone came from the ruler of the synagogue's house saying, your daughter is dead, do not trouble the teacher. Now again, I'm just trying to tie it into today's world where we're at today. And there could be news coming to you that could be very rattling about other people that you know that are ill or people that you know who have died of the coronavirus. Look, I'm not denying that those things are scary. Okay, but who do we serve? We serve the greater God. Greater is he in us than he that's in the world. And greater works will we do. Wow, that's a pretty high standard, isn't it? So what are you going to do with that information that's coming in your ears? Are you going to let it derail you and cause you to just hide in a corner? Or are you going to stay active in the word and in the Lord and in praying for people over the phone, online, however the Lord can use you? Because in the times like this is when people are crying out to God. And they want to meet somebody who knows that he's real. And you're that person. You know he's real. He's done miracles in your life. And you can help lead them. So again now, this man Jairus, he was desperate enough to come to Jesus and ask for help. But now he's turning around and they're saying, don't bother him, your daughter's dead. The first thing Jesus says in verse 50 of Luke 8, fear not, only believe. Same thing Elijah said to the widow. Fear not, only believe. I'm saying that to you, that it's a word from the Lord for us for this season. Fear not, only believe. Don't give place to the enemy in your life. Give no place to the devil. Fear not, only believe. Sounds easy, not so easy to do, is it? But Jesus said, she will be made well. If you can do this, she will be made well. And we have to trust him for that kind of miracle, okay? So I'm just going to wind it down now because um, I, I'm missing all of you very much being here at church on a Sunday and on a Tuesday night and just all the different ways that we interact. But God, okay? But God, if he could cause ravens to bring Elijah to a lonely place by the riverside that was drying up, he can meet your needs. He could supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus, right? And in the New Testament, Jesus says, don't be anxious about today, about tomorrow, I'm sorry. Today's got enough issues of its own. So when you're in a crisis time like we're in right now, it's kind of like a war zone. You shorten your time frame down, and don't be worried about where you're going to go on vacation this summer. All right? Don't project ahead. Deal with right now. 
Deal with the moment. There's people that he's bringing you into your path that you can help. And there's that wonderful gospel song by Tremaine Hawkins called Be Grateful. And I'll never forget the two lines that always stuck with me is that there's always someone else that's worse off than you. So could you look at your situation and complain? Yeah, but don't, don't forget, there's always someone else that's worse off than you. And then the next line says, there's always someone else who would love to be in your shoes. So be grateful. <laughs> All right. There's other people you want to be in their shoes? Maybe not. You don't know. All I'm saying is be thankful for what you do have. And just call out to God. He said, if you seek for me with all your heart, I, I will be found. You will cry out to me. David said, I sought the Lord. He heard me, and he delivered me from all my fears. So let's be victorious people. We're coming into this Passover season, this resurrection power. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead next Sunday is the spirit that lives inside of you. So you have a lot of reason to be excited and happy about serving God. In the midst of the storm, he's sleeping in the back of the boat. That's the kind of peace that we want. In the midst of a drought, Elijah's saying, you know what? I know the birds are going to bring me my food tonight. I'm not getting rattled. I'm just going to keep seeking the face of the Lord. So I want to wind up with a prayer because a lot of people watch this. Maybe you just stumbled on this and you, you don't know what we're about and you have ever been to this church, but you're hearing something that is striking a connection with your heart. Because it's just tormenting to be suffering from the fear that's going on in the world right now. But Jesus Christ is called the Prince of Peace. He can come into your life in a personal relationship. You can have a personal relationship with an eternal living God. And that same spirit that caused life to come into his dead body can come into your life right now through a surrender. Just through saying, God, whatever I'm doing isn't working, so I don't have a whole lot to lose to try something different. It's called the Bible, the Word of God, the New Testament. Read the Gospel of John. Read the Gospel of Luke, and then read the book of Acts. There's about 80 chapters for you right there. And, and see the power of God becoming a man. Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. He lived through his whole life and never sinned, but he identifies with us in our sin. Every answer, I'm telling you, every answer you need is in the book. You might need a little help figuring it out. No problem. That's what the church does. We'll help you reach out to us. But let's just say a prayer together. If you're in that hijacked position, if you're in a position of realizing I've been building my house on sinking sand, I need to build my house on the rock of Jesus. When the storm comes, that house is still standing because it's built on a rock. Just say, Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I recognize that there's sin in my life and I need to be saved from the power of that sin. I can't do it. Can't save myself. But I heard good news today that you came in the flesh and you lived as a man, but you did not sin. And then when you went to the cross, you took the punishment for sin that I deserved. You took it on your back. You died for me and love me enough to have a personal relationship if I make you my Lord. So I choose to turn from my lifestyle of sin and turn to a lifestyle with you. I need to understand the truth of what your word says. I need to have the power of your Holy Spirit living on the inside of me. I don't know how you're going to do it, Lord, but I trust that you will do it. I bow my knee to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Fill me with the power of your Spirit and the truth of your Word. Connect me with other believers in life-giving relationships so that I can grow into the full identity that you had for me when I was still in my mother's womb. I receive you as my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so 
If you said that prayer, that's a big deal. That's why somebody's clapping here. It's a big deal. Because it says in the Bible that when one sinner comes to repentance, and we were all sinners, so we've all sinned and fallen short of that. So there's nothing wrong with saying that I turned away from my sin because we all had to do that. It said there's a book in heaven and your name gets written in that Lamb's book of life. So this is a great day, April 5th, 2020, that you can mark down and say that was my new birthday in the Lord. And reach out. We're here, easy to find, King of Kings Worship Center. You can find us very easily online, and we'll give you whatever you need. Send you a Bible. If you're close by, come over, meet with us, we'll pray with you, however we can do it. The, the church exists to see people come closer to God and to see lives changed by the miraculous power that only he can offer. No more counterfeits. Do the real thing. With that, I'm going to end. I pray you have an awesome day. Let's just call an end to this coronavirus so that we can get back to our lives again and we can connect with each other and hug and, and do everything that God designed us to do. Till we meet again, have an awesome day.